Uh, Dr. Ferrego is a full-time practicing direct primary care doctor in Forest, Virginia. Uh, he started Forest Direct Primary Care four years ago and is one of the leading voices in the direct primary care movement. Uh, he is uh, the author of four books, two of which are two of the most popular direct primary care books that you can get on Amazon, and he'll have some of those here today. Uh, he is the inventor of the product called the Knee Saver, uh, which is currently in the Baseball Hall of Fame. The Knee Saver and its knockoffs <laughs> are worn by most Major League Baseball catchers. He is also the inventor of the cryo helmet, uh, used by athletes for head injuries, uh, as well as migraine sufferers. Uh, from 2001 to 2011, you may recognize Dr. Ferrego uh, as the editor of the Placebo Journal, which ran for 10 full, full years. Uh, oftentimes described as the mad magazine for medicine. Um, and so he and the Placebo Journal were featured in Washington Post, U.S. News, World Report, uh, the Associated Press, the New York Times. Uh, and Dr. Frego is now the editor of the blog called Authentic Medicine at AuthenticMedicine.com, uh, which has been born out of the concern about where the direction of healthcare is heading and the belief that the wrong people are in charge. This blog has been going daily for more than 15 years. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our lunchtime keynote speaker, Dr. Doug Farrago. Hi, my name is Doug. I'm a recovering employed physician. Welcome, Doug. For 15 years, I was pimped out by two hospital systems. I sold my body for my bosses as I worked the clientele going from room to room to room. Physically, I was there, but mentally, and emotionally, I had to disconnect just to survive. I had lost all self-control, I would lost self-esteem, and I basically just felt dirty. And it took me years of reflection to realize that basically I was just a stripper from my hospital. <laughs> a stripper um, without the tassels. <laughs> as far as anybody knew. Wink. Um, So, so why, did I, why did I continue? Why does everybody continue? You know, it's comfort level. You get stuck in a situation where you're making a living. We've all been there. It's tough to get, uh, it's tough to uproot your family. It's tough to get off the pole. And I, I was a decent revenue generator and I worked that pole. And I could not get off the pole. But my colleagues and I also had something called uh, learn helplessness. You know, it's that phenomenon where an elephant, you tie a large rope on an elephant's leg on one end, and on the other end, you can tie it to a stake, and the elephant will fight for a while, and then it's going to stop fighting. And you can get that rope smaller and smaller and smaller until the elephant doesn't want to fight anymore. That was us. My colleagues and I would complain to my bosses, contracts, you know, metrics, whatever, and they were so proficient in verbal judo, <laughs> co confusion, and distraction that we never could win, ever. It, it, it was absolutely amazing. We would complain and they would say, well, thank you for bringing this to our attention. And I hear you. You're a valuable asset to this organization. And then they say, then they bring out this a metaphorical shell game, you know, with three shells and there's a ball underneath, they start playing the shell game, okay? It's, uh, they'd say things like, you know, you can look for a job somewhere else, but you won't find a comparable salary anywhere else and you live in a very beautiful provincial city in New England where it's basically the jewel of the north meets the pearl of the east, okay? So look for the ball. And we'd say, I don't know that one. I'm like, ah, not there, okay? <laughs> and we'd give up. Now, we live in a nice place. It was okay in Maine, but, you know, it was a poor state of Maine. I was not on the coast. I was in a mill town. It was 20 below in the winter, and I worked in a federally qualified health center which is a very difficult patient panel, but we bought it. We ate it up. That rope got smaller and smaller and smaller. <clears throat> we went back to them later on and said, hey, listen, you know, doctors are leaving. And they did leave, and we couldn't get anybody to fill the position. So we'd go back and say, you know, what are you going to do about this? Because I, I need someone, you know, I'm doing more call. I'm not getting compensated for that call. And I'm getting more documents thrown into my, into my system. I got to sign. What are you, how are you helping us? Get us another doctor. And they'd say... <laughs> Thank you again. 
for engaging us with this. You're a valuable asset to this organization, so I appreciate that. And then they say, they bring out the, they bring out the shell game, and they say, you know, we've played a very expensive consultant. And that consultant said that, you know, the salaries out there that they're offering are outliers, and we can't compete with that. And it looks like we really can't find anybody to come up here this far north. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. you know, my colleagues would be like, oh, okay, and they start leaving. I'm like, guys, where are you going? What about the whole jewel of the north and the pearl of the east thing? And the, the hypocrisy. And I turned back to the, uh, the administrators, and they're still playing the game. Like, pick one. I'm like, I don't want to pick one. Pick one. That one, ah, I'm not there, okay? The ball was never there, guys. We never found our balls, okay? <laughs> the string got smaller and smaller and smaller. You take that learn helplessness, okay, and you add a nice smidge of Stockholm Syndrome, you know, where the, the captors have sympathy for their, um, the, the, the prisoners have sympathy for their captors, you add a little bit of smidge of that, you have the perfect recipe for physician obedience. And that's what they have. You put that in the oven for 325 for about three years, you take it out, that physician meat falls right off the bone, okay? <laughs> so that's where our story starts. <laughs> Once upon a time, a likable but flawed character has her goal threatened. Likable, we all like family docs, primary care docs, right? What's the flaw? What's the flaw with us? Too kind, too trusting, too altruistic, too giving. What's the goal threatened? Just wanted to be the doctor we wanted to be without obstruction, to, be, to help patients, to actually have a you know, truly great relationship with our patients. But you can't. You can't in this environment because the lay of the land is poisonous. Julie brought this up. And basically, 54% uh, morale is negative. 63% of negative feelings now about the future of the profession. 49% they often or always experience burnout. 49% wouldn't recommend this to their kids. Every other doctor, in other words, is compromised. Every, one, every other one of you guys are compromised. Every other doctor you bring your kids to is compromised. Every other colleague you work with is compromised. And I've seen it. I've seen it with my, one of my partners who basically degraded in front of my eyes and aged extremely quickly while he was in this profession. Now I'm going to show you his pictures because he let me do this. And uh, I'll call him John for simplicity's sake because his name is John. You, know, you guys are eating lunch. So please, please, if you have a, a weak stomach, avert your eyes. I'm not trying to hurt and make him puke. But this is John when he started, a young go-getter ready to take on the world as a family doc. Not that long after, this was John. The age goes quickly. Then there was this awkward stage, which he doesn't want me to talk about. <laughs> and then there was this. Yeah, I know, right? Is that not, this is not a scene from the show The Walking Dead. Or is it? Okay, that's just terrible. So I actually had to name this phenomenon because he was my friend. I call it the premature physician progeria, okay? <laughs> or the quickening aging process of a doctor. Now, John left my practice, I'm still best friends with him, and he went to work in an ER, but it was, he was still as miserable. And, uh, and he actually sent me a selfie of himself uh, to show how he, was, how he was doing, and I'll show that picture as well. Um, <laughs> actually, when I look at this now bigger, I actually don't think that's a selfie. He may have drawn that, um, but it's a, the, the likeness is incredible. So, so why is this happening? You know, why does this happen? Because this is what we wanted, right? We wanted to be the doctor to give a lollipop and spend time with our patients, and this is what we got. Now, I feel bad for this guy. I have no idea who he is. I ripped his picture out of the internet. It wasn't about being burned out or anything, but he represents everything that's terrible about this job. In fact, I think if you shaved his head, he'd look like my friend John. Is this what we all expected to be as a doctor? Did anybody envision being a family doc doing this? This guy's not staring at the patient. He's miserable. He's typing in the computer. <sighs> um, you know, I don't know what to say about that, and, and I'm almost embarrassed by the profession, but I guess, I guess, I mean, the, the good part of the guy is still working, because doctors are quitting. They're quitting their job. I actually, it was like a year, about a year and a half ago, I actually saw a homeless person with a sign that said, we'll do a complete review of systems for food. So I went up to him, I said, okay. And he said, okay, what? Like a real attitude, you know? So I said, no, do a complete review of systems. He said, 20 bucks. 
So uh, that's a lot, I thought, but you know, I gotta see what's going on here. So I gave him 20 bucks. He said, okay, you ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. He said, how you feeling? I said, oh, pretty good. He says, there's your complete review of systems. I'm a surgeon. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but there was an awkward pause. I didn't laugh at that. And he said, come on, dude, seriously, how many surgeons are homeless? I'm a family doc, you know? So, uh, he said, <laughs> so he said, let's do it for real. I said, all right, go for it. He said, right, I'm gonna go fast. So if you're ready, get ready. I said, I'm ready. He says, do you have any weight gain, weight loss, headaches, visual problems, problems hearing, sore throat, problems swallowing, chest pain, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, blood in your stool, nausea, vomiting, rashes, joint pain, erectile dysfunction? And I said, yeah. And um, he said, what do you mean, yeah, which one? I said, all of them, you know, two turnarounds for a play. And he gave me the 20 bucks back and said, that's why I quit being a family doc, okay? <laughs> now, there's some embellishment to that story. Oh, I, have to, I have to agree. I mean, come on, erectile dysfunction? <laughs> um, I have an erection as we speak, so that's, I mean, um, that would be an awkward talk, right? You imagine that? Why is that, guy, why is that lecturer so close to the podium? I swear, I thought it was my blood pressure medicine. Anyway, um, no, but the review of systems to me is an example of dogma that was been placed upon us for no reason accepted, but it's done for billing, right? We still, a lot of us carry it over, but it's absolutely a joke, never been proven, never been t tested. We do it for billing only. And it's that kind of dogma is an example of the things we just accept. And in fact, you can actually see how, no one does it. It's a dirty little secret we all do. We all have lied about our review of systems. Every one of you have lied of how many you truly asked, okay? A lot of you guys have just clicked all and never asked those questions. So how do we continue that garbage? In fact, you can tell somebody how far they are in practice by how many review systems they really ask. Um, I did this chart. When you start out as a newbie, maybe 15 review of systems. Year one, maybe five. Year two, maybe two. And then year three, you don't even ask them anymore. So then you can basically say, well, how could you have a, ask a negative amount of review of systems? Well, that's where you go in the room and say, there's nothing wrong with you, right? <laughs> but the result of all this is doctors are quitting. They're doing drugs. They're drinking. They're taking psychoactive substances or on psychiatric meds. And they're killing themselves. Julie mentioned this as well. Right now, medical profession consistently hovers as one of the highest risk of death by suicide. A doctor kills himself or herself on average each day in this country. It's not doctor heal thyself, it's doctor kill thyself. Which brings us back to our story. The hero um, encounters hurdle after hurdle and decides enough is enough. So the good news about this poisonous, toxic environment is usually that's what heroes are made if you watch any fantasy or any movie. And that's kind of what happens now. But, but this is disclaimer I want to give is I'm not the hero of this story. I'm using uh, the pronoun her for a reason. And it, it could be her or him, but it's not me. I, uh, I stayed in the system definitely way too long. I definitely am broken in a lot of ways still today. And um, I passed my expiration date. I had to spend 15 years in that system. And I think it, it took effects on me. And it's not like I didn't try, man. I, I mean, I had plans after plans after plans, and they were ridiculous, some of them, to get out. I just wanted to get out, and then DPC wasn't there, but I, I tried. I'll share one with you now, but I, rem I actually, my best friend and, and uh, medical partner, we were chief residents, and we worked together for 15 years, uh, Ray. Ray, how you doing if you're watching on live stream? But we used to go to coffee every day at Starbucks at lunch just to keep him breast, and that's where I had hatched one of my, I thought was my best plan. I said, dude, I just saw this movie called Strangers on a Train. It's where these two strangers meet, and they both want, want to off someone, so if they just exchange murders, it, it won't be tracked back to them, and they'll get off scot-free. So I said, hear me out. You're my doctor in real life. I'm your doctor in real life. If we just do malpractice on each other, okay, I sue the crap out of you. You sue the crap out of me. They won't track it back, and we can finally retire. That's that was my best plan before DPC, okay? So just take, keep that in mind as you listen to the rest of this lecture. The hero tries to work within the system. What if, what if our weakness is a problem? 
You know, we're too giving, too trusting, too altruistic, too, too much just care about the patient. See, others take that weakness and that trust and they take it for uh, that, that kindness and take it for weakness. See, we can't, if we, it's great that we want to work with the system, but what if the system truly never wants to work with us? I mean, that, we have to come to that conclusion at some point. Um, because when they control us like they have and we keep trying, we burn out. And that's what's going on right now. It's the biggest new fad. Everybody's talking about doctor burnout. Everybody loves it. And thankfully, I actually have a tear in my eye here. There's an organization that's truly helping us out now with this. The AFP and burnout. Ah, <laughs> oh, just thank, thank goodness, OK? The AFP, let me read some of the things there at their recent proceedings. They joined the National Collaborative to promote condition well-being. They joined the House members to spark burnout. I don't know what that means. Speaker charts path from physical burnout to well-being. I bounce back from burnout by setting boundaries and priorities. I filled my prescription against burnout at the gym. Try probe tool to help stave off burnout. What the hell's the probe tool, right? <laughs> OK, I, I thought I'd been probed for years. Um, can mindfulness meditation deliver us from burnout? And my favorite, physician burnout, the AFP is winning battles for you. And to that, I'm like, OK? <laughs> That's like throwing dice in, in Vegas on the craps table, and you're the chips. I'm not sure what you thought that gesture was. All right. I, I'm, actually, I'm right-handed, so that didn't, didn't make sense at all. Um, listen, guys, um, the AFP, it, the AFP is a great agreed to every mandate enforced upon us, every CPT code and addition every RVU system that is makes us the lowest paid. They've agreed to every quality metric. They've agreed to every acronym. They've agreed to every EMR change. They've agreed to pay for performance. They've, they've agreed and went to bed with the insurance companies and the government. Why are we listening to the same people who put us in this position? Julie mentioned the bully situation. What if it's like a bully punching you in the face saying, how can I help? And they're just pounding you. You're like, well, for one, you can stop punching me in the freaking face, okay? If the AAFP was the Titanic, it would back itself up repeatedly to hit the iceberg to generate more data, okay? <laughs> then it would come back to us and say, you know, we're gonna have to work with that iceberg, okay? <laughs> Why they do this? Because we are, their members are steerage at the bottom of the boat and behind the gate. They're up on the parlor deck with brandy and a cigar playing cards. And they're like, well, Reginald, I see your macro, and I raise you two mips. <laughs> <laughs> so they know nothing of burnout, about burnout. I know things about burnout, OK? Because I was the case study, the, 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 the participant in the landmark case study on burnout. And it was in the prestigious journal of the Reader's Digest, okay? This is a true story. 2008, you can Google it. 41 things doctors never tell you. And in it, doctors would kind of reveal their secrets. It was a clickbait kind of uh, magazine. Back then, it was more magazines to get you to buy it. Like, what a doctor's not going to tell me? And they were the lamest things in the world. Like, I'll give you an example. This, oh, this, uh, the most unsettling thing for a physician is when the patient doesn't trust you or believe you. Obstetrician, gynecologist, New York City. Like, that person couldn't give their name for that, right? I mean, whoa, that's brave. Now, let's go on the other end of the spectrum, and let's look at this idiot. I know that Reader's Digest recommends bringing a complete list of all your symptoms, but every time you do, it only reinforces my desire to quit this profession. OK? Dude, that is such pathology, I can't even tell you, all right? If that isn't a burned out doctor who should be stopped. Now, I love that because I rip on not only patients, myself, the system, but I even rip on Reader's Digest in a meta way, and they actually printed it for some reason. Someone must have got fired over that. So let's, let's, let's tell you, for, with, I was burned out, and I actually figured out a 10-point burnout test. I'm going to give it to you now. Let's have a little fun. It'll take a, give yourself a point for the, each one. Do not tell anybody if you get the point. You don't want to embarrass yourself. But these are 10 questions which will find out 
because I know 50% of you are probably burned out anyway, but these 10 questions will figure it out for you. If you say yes to any of these, it's a point, right? So this is the 10 question burnout test, and here we go. <sighs> Do certain patients on your schedule actually make you violently shake or cry? Number two, do you secretly envy the job of old friends every time you see them pumping your gas? <laughs> Number three, are you slowly digging a hole through one of your office walls to escape like the main character in Shawshank Redemption? I fantasized about that forever. I had a poster right behind me like, I can dig through that, I know I can. <laughs> Number four, do you find yourself wanting to tell a patient, shh, you had me at hello, in order to get rid of them? Number five, are you secretly planning to get a disability by contracting a disease that is seronegative? <laughs> Number six, have you already gotten and passed a stress test due to chest pain or palpitations? Number seven, have you already bumped your PPI to BID? <laughs> Number eight, are your kids asking how long will it be before you retire and they're less than 10 years of age? Number nine, my favorite, do you sarcastically answer patients in your head and become uncomfortable when they ask why you're smiling? <laughs> and you got, yeah, I list a lot of points on that one. And number 10, are you actually considering becoming a medical administrator? Here's the score. Zero, you're lying or in some type of psycho apps, uh, substance apps, active substance. One to three, you're fresh out of residency or are retiring in the next year. Four to six, most doctors are here, time to think about a career change, and seven to 10, you're toast. DPC is your last chance. So um, we know that about 50% uh, of you probably are in that situation. And I think the crazy part is that we continue to think we're going to fix this broken system from within. And that's where we have failed. You can't fix this mess. Okay, you just can't. It, it's, it's stupid, it, do, it does nothing to help. Um, it's like putting lipstick on a pig, it doesn't work, and it offends the pig, actually, okay? So no amount of AFP brainstorming in their proceedings is gonna, is gonna change overwork, seven minute visits, uh, EMRs that don't work, useless clicks, quality metrics that are bogus, and gobs and gobs of bureaucracy. That will never change, no matter what meeting they have. So I gotta give an example of what this bureaucracy is, because we always use the word, but we can't really define the picture. Well, the picture is administrators, guys. That's the bureaucracy, because I've dealt with them for any, a long time. And before I go on, I have to stop here, because I sometimes get in trouble, but uh, are there any hospital administrators here at all? <laughs> before I go on, anyone raising? Okay, wow, so I won't have to speak slower. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think all administrators are bad. I think most administrators are bad. But I don't think all of them are, because I think that there's those newbies that, that come out, and they're the new ones that are actually, when they're, you're an uh, employed doctor, they work with you as a practice manager, and they're trying to work with you. They're young ones, they're nice, but they're squeezed on the back end by the administrators. So it's kind of they're stuck beh behind a rock in a hard place, right? It's really hard for them, and we, it burns them out. The crappy ones go right up and get promoted real high, and the ones that are nice actually just can't take it and, and quit. I've had about a dozen in 15 years quit. It's like a, a new prison guard. You know, new prison guard that gets along with the prisoners okay, uh, treats them well, they like him, and he gets ripped into the uh, old prison guard's uh, office, and the old prison guard says, if any of these doctors give you any guff, you shock them with this taser, okay? That's what they, that is what they want that is what they want from these people, and these guys can't do it. So the problem is they leave, and you have the rest of the administrators, okay, who are, have some major issues and has caused the problems of this burnout. For one, and here's my issues, there's too many. Julie mentioned this slide. There's 3,000% increase. That, that's an old slide, too, and you have hardly any increase of administrators. When I see that slide, I actually look at it in my draded and weird warp sense, I see the jars of chicken fat, okay? <laughs> The chicken stock stays the same, but the chicken fat gets more and more. Because that chicken fat doesn't produce anything, man. They don't bring any billing. They don't do a service that brings money in. There's hardly any that are needed, but they keep rep reproducing like rabbits, and that pressure, that puts the pressure on us financially, and has been part of the major change that has made this job so terrible. The next issue is they treat us terribly. 
Listen, it wasn't always like that. I was started out in the late 90s. It just got worse and worse. They treat us now like we're replaceable. How do I know? Because they say, you're replaceable, okay? <laughs> you're a pawn in the chess set. That's all you are to them. And they think they can get anybody, anybody to take your position. And now they're doing it. It's demeaning, it's devaluing. And the ironic thing is, if a doctor was gone one day, missing one day, is chaos. If an administrator is gone for a month, it's like, is anybody, anybody seen Bill? <laughs> Actually, that's a lie. They wouldn't even notice at all, okay? <laughs> that's the difference between us and needed and they're needed. My third issue is we, they have too much power. They're drunk with that power right now. 80% of doctors, this is an older slide, 2011, now 80% of doctors are employed by physicians, I mean by hospitals. The reason is we had to circle the wagons, right? Because um, we had to circle the wagons because we had to protect ourselves against insurers and bill the right way. Well, the problem was we said, okay, let's work with the hospitals, let's become employed, and they just welcomed us in with their you know, open heart to take us in, right? But it reminds me of a horror movie, you know, where the, the teenager's van breaks down and it's in the rain and they find safety in that, uh, uh, that old abandoned house. We all know what happens in the morning is carnage, okay? That's what's going on with us right now, is carnage. They do have way too much power. The marriage between a doctor and a hospital being employed, it's an unholy matrimony. Now, we're seeing unbelievable things happen. This is an example in California, but it's not uncommon. It's been happening again where the administrator said, hey, you know what? We don't like with medical staff. We don't like the bylaws. Fire them. Fire the medical staff and rewrite the bylaws the way we want. And they did it. And now there's a lawsuit going on about that. You imagine that the arrogance to say, we'll just change everything? Well, they can. They have the leverage. And they're doing it all over and over again. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, this being drunk with power, I have an example of a friend, John. John went from an ER doc to administrators, okay? And I t bust his chops all the time, and about a month and a half, I texted him to see what he's doing, and he's high up in administration. And I texted him, I said, hey, wh what are you doing? He said, meeting. So I said, so you're doing nothing? No answer. He said, then I responded, sesame or poppy bagels, big decisions. No answer. <laughs> Next day, I said, I guess you went with sesame. Finally answers me, state visit, unscheduled, five hours, went fine. I eat in the midst of it to register my displeasure and to, not to, and to portray I'm not rattled. My response to him was, you wrote that as if you're JFK staring down Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Talk about a sense of self-importance. And basically you said, I've always been distorted. They're all distorted. They think they are running healthcare because they're administrators. They are absolutely drunk with power. And what that's, what, to understand that is to understand what they want and don't want. They want control, productivity, money, awards, and prestige. What they don't want is controversy, being questioned, friction, resistance, and disruption. How do I know? I'm everything in the second column, okay? <laughs> and that's why I'm so jaded. I was cheated over and over and over again. Every contract was changed and cheated, every single one. Every, they, they pulled the shell game out continuously. We never found it. The strong, the, the, the rope and string got smaller and smaller. And I finally, after one, 10 years, me and my two partners went from one hospital in the city to the other, lost the lawsuit, but we were covered by the new lost, uh, hospital because they knew they were getting our patients, which was an incredible amount of money for them. And it was a honeymoon period for like six months. And then we were like working like, my, my feet are getting killing me, they're burning. Why is it so hot? And then we realized we went from one freaking frying pan to the other frying pan, okay? The same things happen. The same things, the same cheats, the same lies, the same administralian, which is their language. The same things happen. And I remember at the end, here I, my plans were not panning out, and I'm like, I need a sign to get out. I need to get out. So I got that sign. <clears throat> there was a letter put in our desk to sign, to actually literally sign, and basically it said, my name, other doctors there, give this kind of third party permission to submit, submit data to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services on my behalf be used for the PQRS, you know, the metric crap, and electronic prescribing. Furthermore, and here's the best part, I will not hold Meridios liable for any improper submissions regardless of fault nor for failure to report to CMS on my behalf. In other words, if they did anything corrupt, and they're trying, their job as bounty hunters is to get as much money as they can. They do anything illegal, I'm held responsible. Now, if you guys don't know this, you do this to the government, you, they can jail you and they will fine you hard, not covered by your malpractice. 
So I said, no, I'm not signing that. That, that. You just hand it in front of me, and I'm not, we even had a discussion. I'm not signing that. My partners, of course, signed that, but I'm not going to sign that. And so then I got a bigger sign, and I was terminated. <laughs> and that's s signed by, uh, at the bottom, Glenn Focht, F-O-C-H-T, okay? <laughs> Rem remember that name. And it took me everything I could in my in my power not to go to the next hospital, meaning with this shirt. I got <laughs> fucked by my hospital. <clears throat> on the 19th day, it was a 20-day firing. On day 19, my wife says, mm, you got a certified letter, and I said, open it. I'm clearing up my desk, and they said they retracted the firing. I had a lawyer up, but it showed to me it doesn't matter, man. It's only gonna get worse. It's only gonna get worse. With her goal threaten, our hero finds the forces of evil too strong. There's no, we have no leverage. With no leverage, you can't work with these people. It's just not going to happen. Because physician happiness is inversely proportional to the amount of bureaucratic drag in our lives. That's just the bottom line. But as they keep growing and flexing their muscle, they're going to do anything to control us and keep their power. That battle is, is, is coming. Now, they're going to pretend they're helping us, like the AFP with their big proceedings. This was, uh, this was an another one I saw. This was at the Mayo Clinic proceedings. Oh, it was big. Now, can I, it's like, I know you really can't see the small one, but there's an obvious misprint here. I don't know if anybody sees it. It says, executive leadership and physician well-being. Well, obviously, you're supposed to say executive leadership destroys physician well-being, but I guess they didn't put that in there, okay? Because that's what it does. There's 125 items that they're going to fix. There's 125 shells. You've now put mascara on that pig. So for us to find the answer um, is to understand that this healthcare equation that they tell us is so unsolvable, that's the, that is the big charade. That's the big con. It's unsolvable. And I've been with administrators, now especially that I'm doing this, and I've sat down with them and I've said, it's not unsolvable. Well, no, you, you can't solve this. I said, if you take out two variables, if you take out the government and you take out the insurance, boop, it's solved. And they're like, wait, wait, what, what? And I said, they'll say, do it again. And they're looking at each other. <laughs> this time, keep your hands high and go slow. I said. Take out the insurance companies, take out the government, boop, it's solved. And they're like, oh, we get it. He's a witch. Um, <laughs> burn him. So what can we do about it? You know what, guys? The best way to get out of a hole is to quit digging. That's the bottom line. The best way to get out of a hole is to quit digging. And so if you really, truly want to find, realize, come to the conclusion that it, there's no ball under there, the shell game was always empty. It's a Kobayashi Maru. If anybody knows Star Trek fame, all commanders have to go through the Kobayashi Maru. And it's an unwinnable uh, program. They don't know that, but they want to see how they do under duress. Well, Kirk says nothing's unwinnable, and he goes in and he tweaks the system so we can beat the Kobayashi Maru, hence how fa uh, Kirk got, Captain Kirk got famous. Well, it turns out if, um, if you tweak it, if you take out those variables, if you become a DPC doc, you beat the Kobayashi Maru. And that's what we're doing right now. You find your ball. And that is where we are next, is the magic formula. The hero finds the magic formula in the magic land to break the system. It's not over, unfortunately. Now, even though, <sighs> <laughs> we are here, OK? And people talk about this kind of, I mean, I love you guys, and I love this conference. and I. Uh, but it drives me a little bit insane, because it's been mentioned today how out of the box DPC is. Revolutionary. I'm like, oh, man, really? If there was a, a doctor from the 1930s, he popped in right over there, what would he say? And I think this conversation would go, uh, I think he'd sit down and say, afternoon. And you're like, I know. afternoon. Um, I heard this speaker's awesome. And uh, <laughs> no, yeah, he's the best. Um, what's this uh, lecture on? DPC. That's swell. Um, can I bum a smoke? No, dude, can't smoke in here. How about a, a swig of some flask of whiskey or something? 
dude, it's like noon. Where are you from? Oh, a thousand pardons. So uh, what's DPC? Direct primary care. Primary care, is that like general practice? Yeah, it's general practice. What's direct mean? Direct means you see the patient directly, they pay you and you just treat the patient. And no, you don't get it, okay? You, there's no insurance company as the middleman, there's no government as the middleman. You treat the patient directly and they pay you, it's direct. I know, I get that, but you're saying in like 80 something years you've made no progress? <laughs> and you're doing exactly what we did back then? Yeah, I guess that's true. You sure there's no um, maybe underground speakeasy we can get some whiskey? <laughs> no, there's no underground speakeasy, but this lecture sucks. I didn't know this guy Vance is a ton of alcohol. Let's go find him, okay? <laughs> so that's how I see that conversation going because we make this, we make this seem like it's foreign. It's normal free market. You don't buy a watch and have someone pay it for you and the watch dealer gets paid a tenth three months later and then you have this watch that you paid some uh, watch insurance. It doesn't work like that. This is, could be normal commerce and it works really well that way. The hero once headed their burnout emerges transformed and rewarded but now others attack, ridicule, ignore, or mock her. See, the early adopters, the early pioneers, the Joshes, the Ryans, the Julies, they did some incredible things, but they, people say, oh, they were lucky because it was new, it's a fad, and they were able to get away with it. It's just luck. And I like this, I like this quote from uh, Shonda uh, Rhimes, who's an executive in, in Hollywood, did Grey's Anatomy, has moved really high up. She says, I'm not lucky. You know what I am? I'm smart, I'm talented, I take advantage of the opportunities that come my way, and I work really, really hard. Don't call me lucky, call me a badass. You see, Josh and Ryan and Julie, I'll use those three for now. Um, they were badasses, man, okay? They broke the barriers, they broke the system, they pushed over the obstacles, and they, they found that magic elixir for all of us. And I think we all owe them a ton of credit, okay? But it's unfortunately not, okay, so they did this with hard work, right? Now, to cut, the, to, to cut back on the praise a little bit, it wasn't like the competition is that hard, okay? It's shooting fish in the barrel. Our system sucks, right? You have the, a system where doctors hate it, patients hate it, and it's like shooting fish in a barrel. How hard is it to beat that? This model, it's very easy to beat that. Three entities go in a room right now in the industrialized model. The computer goes in, the doctor goes in, and the patient goes in. Goes in. Coming out, the doctor leaves unsatisfied, the patient leaves unsatisfied, and maybe the computer satisfied. That's our competition. It's a joke, and they do that in three minutes. So, the, so uh, giving these guys credit, they have found the initial way to make this thing work, but there's, a more, there's more work to, 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 to go, because it is now some different battle lines are drawn. You know when we, they mentioned this earlier, oh, that doctor's smiling, and he's probably a DPC doc. You know when you tell somebody, hey, they ask how you're doing, and they're in the industrialized model, and they're like, oh, I'm doing great, man, I see about, I don't know, eight patients a day. I get paid more than I was when I was in the model. I am home every day at 4.30. I don't know, life's pretty good. How are you doing? You just know they hate your freaking guts, okay? <laughs> and part of that reason is they're still in the industrialized model. They have what's called death row syndrome, all right? And death row, everybody's, we're in it together until one dude gets pardoned, and then they hate that guy, all right? Because the reason is that guy's going to freedom, and they're still going to die. And so understand them and why they're, je they, they're jealous a little bit of us. But there's ways to help them. But there's others. I ripped this off from, uh, from Ryan. I don't even know if I, he knew I took this. It was a Twitter to him, a Twitter uh, feed. And it said, whoever this guy is, said direct, at, at New Care, direct primary care is a last gasp by PC doctors trying to get paid as much as a specialist, but it doesn't uh, scale, CQ lines. And my response to that was like, mother you know, but, um, <laughs> so, yeah, why did Q-Lions fail, right? I mean, why did, why did turntable fail? Well, let's take that equation. We have a good equation, we've solved it, but let's put the government back in and let's put the insurance companies in, boop, it's unsolvable. Dude, it's a simple math, okay? That's why they fail. We, 
we don't fail. It's a 90% success rate for, of small DPC docs. 90%. Restaurants like a 95% failure rate in five years. We're 90%. We're winning this battle every single day. We're hitting that tipping point. And let me tell you, man, it's a, it's a wonderful life. It is a wonderful life. In fact, the other day I had my laptop open and another DPC doc was uh, on, on DPC doc's Facebook page was opening her clinic and my daughter was on my lap, Zuzu, and she said, look daddy, another family doctor got her wings. And, um, <laughs> and that's the absolute truth. I mean that as a joke, but as from my heart, okay? But we're not done with them, because they're going to try to bury us. I used this slide last year. I hardly use anything the same. But they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. They're going to try to bury us. And we need to know a couple things. One, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man or woman. Be unreasonable. It's time. It's time we stop being too kind, too giving, too altruistic, too trusting. It's time. Our careers depend on it, man. I like Robin Sharma. If you don't heard, if you've heard of him, look him up. Stop being a prisoner of your past. Become the architect of your future. It's time to move on. It's time to be the architects of our future. The, the, the perfect job does not exist. I have one unhappy audience person. Um, <laughs> the perfect job does not exist. We have to create it. And this is pretty close. So. You are the heroes of this story, not me. If in small way, you know, I, I, I try to, you know, I, I'm older now. I don't have my expiration date's kind of old right now. And I, I try to give with the books and talk some, some advice as a mentor. But you definitely are the heroes. You're the grunts of healthcare. You're the warriors in the trenches. Um, you're the good guys. And that's the best part about it. They can't hate us. Because, and they want to hate us. But we're the good guys. We're the primary care docs that are not trying to, you know, uh, gouge patients for money. The right politically and the left politically can't hate us. Where does that exist, right? They both like us. We are the good guys. Now, I've been asked before, multiple times, but I've been asked before would I ever go back being, a, 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 being an employed physician. And I, I say to them, and, and you guys probably know that now, I am what you would label unemployable, okay? Um, <laughs> But not everybody believes me that I would still not do it if I had to. And I have to be more descriptive. I apologize that this offends anybody. But you do have to get your point across to some people. I tell them I would rather have my scrotum rubbed across a cheese grater and dipped in lemon juice before I went back and became an unemployed physician. That usually grabs them. Right there, that gets them, OK? But if it doesn't work, I have to show them this, OK? Dude, I tell them, listen. I'll play optometrist. Sure, I can play optometrist. This is a chart that we've shown before. And this is the chart with DPC. Look, and I made this up, but it's pretty comparable. These are DPC docs, and now those are the amount of administrators. So let's play, let's play getting your eye exam. Which one looks clearer? OK? Which one looks like a future that's brighter? Which one do you see yourself happier in? Because the bottom line is, um, this situation we put ourselves into has take away, taken away that um, bureaucratic, that, that coefficient of friction of bureaucratic drag. DPC removes that friction. But it is not over. The hero needs the warnings and shares them with others. And we'll play a little Game of Thrones here. The administrators, they're still, they want to sit in the Iron Throne and make us uh, bend the knee, okay? They definitely want to control us. And then you have on the other end administrators, um, excuse me, hospitals and insurers and the government who have their army of dead doctors, okay? When I see that, I actually see this, but um, <laughs> who want to destroy us. What we have now is small kingdoms. We have our winter fells. We have our uh, small little kingdoms that are doing really well, and, and that's great, but we can't just be isolated. You absolutely have to connect with other, one, other these small kingdoms because we have to defend the wall, okay? And winter is coming. Believe it or not, winter is coming. So the, the bottom line is you have to stand together. I stand, I can tell you right now, I stand with House Lassie. I stand with House Umber. I stand with House Davidson, okay? I stand with House Gunther. And I'm asking you guys to consider standing with us, okay? Because it is now your turn 
to make this thing a reality. You need to motivate others to act. Here's your call to action. Fulfill your dream. Man, don't wait anymore. You thought about it enough, okay? You probably should have done it a year ago. Become a DPC doc. It's time. It is your dream. It's the doctor you always dreamed of being. Encourage others to do this as well, okay? Because that's how we grow. Evangelize. It's okay. Yeah, you can mention the negatives. There are some negatives. But evangelize and tell others how great this is. Don't sell out. And you will be tempted. The government's going to come calling. Insurers are going to come calling. Brokers are going to come whoring themselves out, okay? Don't sell out. Because the bottom line is, um, your only way, if you put those two variables back into the formula, it will fail. And be patient. If you've started this, like, oh, I only have so many patients, and this person has so many, don't compare to each other. Everybody lives in different areas. The demographics are uh, different. And then just learn from them. Instead of being jealous, ask them, what are you doing? Call them up. And that is why the, the DPC docs on Facebook is so cohesive. And I do recommend you guys form your smaller Facebook groups of other DPC docs so you can share information in a smaller group so, that it, so it's not bogged down by a big group. Most importantly, spread the DPC virus. Every day, make this an epidemic. That's how it becomes a tipping point. Remember, what we do in life echoes in eternity. I do believe DPC is the savior for direct primary care. That guy that ripped on uh, Ryan in that Twitter um, uh, or that tweet, he wasn't wrong. It is the last gasp. We are the canaries in the coal mine. Okay? They're waiting for us to suffocate. Our job is not to not only suffocate, but to thrive. We have to prove them wrong. We do that by working together, supporting each other, motivating each other, keeping motivated. It is not easy. Oh, I have 600 patients, so I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm fine. Well, that's great, but you know what? Then it's hard sometimes. You're still a doctor. It's a tough job. You see bad things. Bad things happen every day to your patients. It's hard to keep motivated. Uh, it's part of the reason I wrote my second book, because I think you need to keep yourself going and keep pu pushing, talking to others, and, and also you know, working on yourself to be the best you can be. The hero continues to break, this, break the rule, and there, I'm sorry this is off kilter, but, uh, and disrupt the system and change the world. If you, you want to be the change you want in the healthcare system, we are the perfect example of a group of doctors that became the change they wanted to see in the healthcare system, and we should be proud of that. I'm going to end here in a minute. I will tell you that um, a story that happened about a month ago, and a uh, true story, I was going to work. And I had a bag of laundry for work. And yes, I do my laundry at my house because that's what DPC docs do, right? So I had a bag of laundry, I had a cup in one hand, I had my backpack with both straps on my, on my, on my uh, shoulders. And my wife saw me and she says, you look like a nine-year-old going to a, a show and tell. <laughs> and I looked in the mirror and I, I did look like a nine-year-old if a nine-year-old had gray hair and was Benj his name was Benjamin Buttons. But um, I did look like a little kid. And I had this massive flashback where... <laughs> I actually remember now, and this is God's honest truth, I was in Comac, Long Island, Indian Hollow Elementary School, I had a show and tell, and my uh, little diorama was of John Paul Jones. And I said, my, I told my wife, you can look it up, but I guarantee this is what he said. He was asked, when he was asked to surrender, surrender, he said, I have not yet begun to fight. And there's been no bigger mantra that, I, that has just kept with me subconsciously for my whole life. And so we all have to take that on and think about that, because we're gonna be asked to surrender. And your response should be the same. We've not yet begun to fight. So before I almost end, I do want to say in this weirdest coincidence, that homeless doc that uh, I talked about in, 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 with the review of systems earlier, I met him recently. And he is not only doing well, he's a successful DPC doc, he's a mentor, and he's uh, turned his life around as a role model. So Lee Gross, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I know you're still doing things on the street for 20 bucks, but no judgment, man. It's, it's not medically related. What you do on your own time is it's between you, you and your family. But um, last few slides, uh, my shame of self-promotion. I'll be doing this a sale after the talk because I need drinking money. And uh, so we have this outside afterwards. I only have 100 of each um, because I, I didn't know what the, the turnout would be. And it's, it's fabulous. It's been so big. Last three slides. <clears throat> don't let this be you, okay? It's your choice. It's your responsibility not to let this be you. Instead, please find your balls, okay? <laughs> and live your life ever after. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you very much. That's funny.